a lot of the entrepreneurs that we look, that we talk to are just, they're literally just taking way too much money out for themselves personally. And that is not something that is visible for the profit. It doesn't reduce your profit to take money out as an owner draw. And of course, everybody needs money. You want to make sure that you have enough money to live on, but you might have to budget or you might have to make some changes. You might have to budget in your personal life, you might have to budget. I would actually, I'm going to change that and say, you have to budget in your personal life and you have to budget in your business. You have to understand those things. Hello and welcome back to the Joyous Path to Millions. I am so excited for today's episode as If you've been tuning in for a while, you know that I love jamming about money and we do that on almost every episode. But whenever I bring guests on who are in the financial services industry, I feel like we're able to go deeper and we're able to explore the topic in a different way. And so I'm excited to do that today. Now, before I introduce our guest and we just dive right in, in case you're new to the show, hi, I'm Emily June Wilcox. I'm a money healer and business mentor, a multi seven figure CEO. I'm the host of this show and the creator of the Money Wound Medicine program. So I talk a lot about money and invite a lot of my clients into doing the deeper subconscious work that keeps us from the wealth that we want. And it's often those limiting beliefs that turn into self-sabotaging behaviors that manifest in our bank account and keep us from the wealth that consciously we are desiring. So that's a little bit about me. And I have Natalia Zacharin. Is that how you say your last name? Okay. Exactly. Perfect. So Natalia is on the show. And could you just start by telling us a little bit about who you are and what you do? Sure. So my name is Natalia. I am the owner of an accounting firm, and we specialize in accounting, bookkeeping, payroll, and CFO services. So that's where we start with the analysis and the review of the actual, like, how healthy is a business. And we've been in business since January 2019. We already have a team of seven, soon to probably be 10 this year. We're growing rapidly. And, and I'm a single mom, started my business in my 50s. I turned 50, the year I turned 50, so I'm never too late to start. <laughs> yeah, that's one of the things that I actually really love about your story is you lost your job during the pandemic or kind of got demoted. Is that right? And, and then that started this entrepreneurial kind of side hustle. Yeah, so I got demoted prior to the pandemic. So we didn't even know the pandemic was going to happen. I saw it. I was with the company for about six years. They were making a lot of changes. They were acquiring other companies. They were getting rid of people. I was very close to the CFO that was there. And when he left, my entire trajectory in that company changed dramatically. And I was very upset about it. Like anybody would be, I felt like it was a personal attack because I was, I worked so hard and I really loved being there. But honestly, looking back on it, and even when it was happening, it was just not my place. It was like the universe was pushing me out, and it was time for me to learn something new. So I just I couldn't find another job. It was really difficult. I needed money. The new salary that they had given me in 2019 was not even enough to cover my expenses, and it was on poverty levels for a family in my state. My gosh. They were trying to make me leave, and I had just met someone that said, hey, you know, he was he's a business owner. He owns a tax firm. He said, why don't you start your own business? And I thought it was crazy. And he said, he said, I was like, in what? And he said, accounting or bookkeeping. And I had no accounting experience. I was invoicing clerk at that job. And before that, I was in sales. So I had no idea. But I figured I'll just teach myself and I'll grab a few clients and just make some, some extra money and on the side. And it just... It started blossoming. It sounds like it's easy now and it blossomed. It was a tremendous challenge and a huge journey. But now I have a multi seven figure firm. So it's only. Oh my gosh. (laughs) I'm obsessed with this because I feel like 99% of people would not have done what you did. Like the courage that it takes to start a business is so high anyway. Then add on top of it, you're midlife, you're a single mom. So it's not like you have this financial runway or a partner who's supporting you or something where it's like, 
well, I can take my time and figure it out. So that's already like we've got two really scary things stacked on top of each other. And then, oh, by the way, you started a business that you actually like had to learn a new skill in order to monetize. I mean, (laughs) that's incredible. Have you always been like a risk taker like that? I look back and I'm like, actually, I've done a lot with my life, but it never, no one ever told me I did. And in fact, I got almost like the opposite my whole life, you know, just whatever you did, like people were like, oh, don't do that. That's not necessary. Oh, well. So I never felt like I was particularly intelligent. I didn't feel like I was smart. I actually almost felt like I was lazy because I think that those words came out of the mouths of like my parents sometimes, maybe less my parents, but definitely when I was married, my husband, which is part of the reason why we're not married. (laughs) It was just like a really bad relationship. And so I just never really felt that way. But when I look back, there have been a lot of times where I just, I had a lot of grit and when I wanted to get something done and I didn't give up, it would happen. Mm -hmm. And I just felt when I started this business that I just didn't have any other choice. And maybe that's even better because when you do have a runway and a, a second income coming in, you relax a lot more. So when things get really hard, you don't necessarily keep going after it because you have choices, you have options. When you don't feel like you have options and you have to keep going, there's no runway to give up. There's just no room for that. And I think that's what happened to me. I'd already been through a tremendous amount of trauma and difficulties in my life by the age of 50. So when I started the business, I was like, well, it just can't be worse than what I've been through already. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, my gosh. So did you start by learning bookkeeping services? Was that the first thing that you offered? So, yeah. So I, I... first got a client. So I I took like a little course on how to start a business, what to do, get your LinkedIn profile going, get your website going. I did a couple of those things. I didn't even have an LLC. I um, signed up for QuickBooks as an accountant. I went through all their training, their pro advisor training, and I sent out my first marketing campaign through email uh, for like my LinkedIn connections. And someone called me on that first campaign <laughs> and I was in a panic and I went through like, because the, the little course I took had the questions, like the discovery questions. Yeah. And I went through just like, I literally read them through. It was just on the phone. And he said, I need you now. And I said, great. You know, can I have your credit card number? And he gave it to me and I got off the phone and like, I don't know what to do. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't even have a proposal or an engagement yet. Yeah. I, I, I have no idea. So it, that the accepting of the money forced me to figure it out. Yeah. Like, it's just, yeah. It, it just, it forced me to figure it out. And I undercharged tremendously and missed like the whole aspect that he, that this accounting needed a tremendous amount of cleanup. I think I worked an extra 45 hours without being paid for it. Yeah. <laughs> now any better, but all of that is a learning experience. It just, you yeah. just learning. So anybody's starting, you're going to make mistakes. And for it. sure. And your prices are almost always going to go up. Like, I don't know anyone who looks back on their journey and is like, oh, I overcharged at the beginning. Like, no, you always undercharge and that's OK. And in a way, it's actually fair. It's not even an undercharge because they're taking a risk on you and you're figuring it out. And and also you're not charging them what they really should be paying. And so it's it works. <laughs> And you're probably not even worth the amount. Like, so, you know, obviously now we charge a lot differently, but I don't think that my value as the knowledge that I had was, it was capable of, of charging what I charge now. So you grow right. into that and you keep changing. Yeah. And it, keeps, it keeps morphing. Yeah, absolutely. So you went from having like your first bookkeeping client. And now I know that, you know, your suite of services includes like kind of fractional CFO services and all of that. So just walk me through kind of, how your skill set continued to expand. I'm guessing you started attracting clients that needed a larger scope of work. Yes. So it was really interesting because I had some kind of sales background and been a very long time ago. This was probably 15 years prior to this that I had a sales background. And I just knew that the more people I talked to, the more opportunity I had to close a client. So I would talk to everybody. Someone would come to my house to fix something. I'd be like, hey, do you need an accountant? You know, bookkeeper and stand in line at the grocery store, like, hey, you know, like, what are you up to? I so I told all of my friends, told everybody absolutely, absolutely new, went on Facebook and, and joined a bunch of entrepreneurial groups and tried to help out. So first of all, it's just selling and doing everything that I possibly could to get my name out there. 
And as I was doing that, so I got one client in January, I think by August, I only had four. I mm-hmm. it took a really long time to figure out how to sell and close. By that time, I thought I had four clients. I can't even make my mortgage payment. However, I'm a single mom. I'm still working full time and commuting. Yeah. And and doing this, it's making me crazy. I'm not doing, at this point, I got to the point where I'm not doing well in either. Mm. So I made a decision and I went in, I think it was close to my 50th birthday. I can't remember now if it was actually on my 50th birthday. I walked in and I quit. And uh, that was in August. And I remember and panicking, but by November, I tripled my client base. So I had 12 wow. in November. Still not making enough to make ends meet. That took another couple of months, but it was just a, a journey in believing myself. And I'm not even sure if I answered your question. <laughs> well, I was just curious, like there's definitely different levels of the kind of service. And so like it's one thing to be doing bookkeeping for a small business. It's another thing to be a fractional CFO, which usually people don't need that until their business is doing at least seven figures. I mean, you can correct me if I'm wrong on that, but it feels like you would have had to do a lot of additional learning and just work on your belief system that you could offer those services and actually deliver a good end result for your clients. Now I remember I was actually getting to that. So I realized as I was talking, I was doing my own sales. I think it's so important for a business owner, especially in the beginning, to do their own sales because you learn so much. You learn about your competition. You learn about what's really important. You ask a lot of questions. So in the discovery process, I would ask a lot of questions and a lot of themes were recurring, uh, but either they don't have anything, they're not looking, they're not evaluating profitability. They don't know what's going on. There was a gap between what their bookkeeper was doing, some of them uh, bookkeepers, and what their CPA who filed their taxes was doing. And the CPA didn't know how to do bookkeeping per se and fix things and didn't really understand QuickBooks Online because the software is also a process to understand. It's not just accounting, you have to understand the software as well. Yeah. And then the bookkeepers didn't know, it was more like data entry, they didn't understand how to read financials and what you have to do on the bookkeeping side as you're reviewing to have it make sense on the financial report so that the business owner has more clarity and then actually to analyze that. So there was this huge gap and I just started analyzing things and I've always been good with numbers. Yeah. But it's really looking at patterns and analyzing things, reading a ton, reading a lot. I love podcasts. I learned tremendous amount from, uh, from podcasts and books, just reading a tremendous amount, learning as much as I possibly can, talking to people. And I just started seeing the need more and more and more. And it started morphing into just analyzing for free or with whatever I was doing, undervaluing basically uh, what I was And to, wait a minute, this is a valuable service that people really, really need. I have to charge for it because I won't survive if I don't. And I have to practice what I preach also. That's kind of how it started. And then the CFO services, when I started selling my first CFO services, figuring out the deliverables. And we work with lots of different industries. So how to make it where it's consistent, uh, our value is consistent with uh, all of our clients and building that out. That was tough. I building out my first forecast and being able to create a forecast from scratch. Yeah. Client, I think I cried <laughs> the first couple of times. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you really have to understand some of the nuances of their business in order to make it happen. Like you said, there it's a real skill set to be able to actually interpret the numbers and apply them to real time decision making instead of just always looking backward. Like, yeah, the looking backward is easy, but it's not that helpful. Yeah, exactly. It's not that helpful. The CFO services are when we actually project it forward right. for a year. And we just, we look and see like, if this is where you are now. This is where you want to be. Are you getting there and looking at it like a little crystal ball? And so you have time to micro correct yes. in the wrong way. And that took just me jumping in and working through those, uh, just like in the beginning of learning the, the bookkeeping and QuickBooks, it just working through it, figuring it out, getting better and better over time, charging more and more. And now we work with companies that are in the multi-millions. I think our largest client is 30 million in gross revenue. So we're wow. not just small clients anymore. The people that are very successful seek our, you know, our analysis and our help. That's amazing. Yeah. Kudos to you. I don't know how it happened. I honestly, it just not giving up. Yeah. 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 And reading like a puzzle of I want to do this and, and then starting to get really interested, very curious. I think 
being curious is really important. Yeah, I totally agree. And being willing to take messy action. Yeah. Yeah. It's not perfect action, just messy action. That's right. That is entrepreneurship. So yeah. what do you see are some themes of just financial gaps or financial misinformation? Because you're behind the scenes and a lot of small businesses. So I'd be so curious to know, like, not only the tactical stuff, like what are people missing? But then I'm curious if you ever pick up on any mindset stuff as well. Oh, definitely. It was really interesting when I was doing a lot of bookkeeping. I could see the mindset in the transactions that were happening mm. and what was happening with the bank account. I wanted to even write an article about it, like a little blog. And then I thought, well, maybe that's not such a good idea because people might think it's a little weird. But there's definitely a mindset of spending at, or lack of spending. You yeah. can tell it's scarcity or abundant. And sometimes it's a lack of spending is scarcity, but sometimes an overspending is also scarcity mindset. I could actually see that because when I was deep into just the bookkeeping piece. I felt like I could read people's minds after a while. And then what do people normally miss? First of all, they don't analyze or look. I can't tell you how many people I talk to that have been in business for quite some time and have never really looked at their financials. Some of them don't even have any financials, meaning they either don't have anything at all, like no software, nothing, or they just have their accountant or CPA create their financials for them at the end of the year for tax purposes. Right. And they never see anything. They have no idea. They just get their number at the end of the year, how much they go in taxes and flying blind. And there's only so long that you can fly blind without getting into trouble. It just sales fixes a lot. It, you could say sales fixes everything. So if you have good skills and you can sell well, it fixes a lot. But boy, can you be a lot more efficient and better if you understand what's going on. So the first thing I'd say is the issue is that people aren't looking. The second yeah. issue is when they're looking, they don't know how to read the financials. They don't know what it means. And then some people have accounting. They even look and and read their financials and they understand, but they don't know how to translate that information into actionable step of where they want to go. So there's like several parts, you know, is it accurate and up to date? Can you analyze it? And then what, after you analyze it, what are the steps that you take? So those are some of the things that are really important. I love everything that you just said. And I think it's so spot on with what I see in, in business and honestly, like what I've done too. So I can call myself out on that. And I think some of it is because financial reports are hard to read and hard to interpret, it does make it challenging. It's like, unless you really want to do it, like to me, a P&L is still not all that intuitive, to be completely honest. And mm -hmm. but I used to think there was something wrong with me. And when we started just working with a fractional CFO in our agency and saying like, ah, can we see the numbers this other way? And like building out custom reports that, again, could be more forward looking, then it changed everything. And so I would just encourage everyone listening. It's like if the standard reports and QuickBooks don't do it for you, that's OK. Like they're kind of not meant to in some respects. And it's really like taking that data and turning it into something useful. And that's what we do with like on the CFO engagement. We take what QuickBooks has, but it's not enough. So when I'm analyzing, I could just analyze QuickBooks, but I use several different reports. I'm not just the P&L, but I look at the P&L by percentage. I look at the year, I look month to month. I look at lots of different variations and the balance sheet and the cash flow statement also. Yeah. But when we are building out like a real CFO engagement, we're taking a lot of different pieces and then we're translating all those numbers and taking ratios and percentages and subtractions. So we're finding that like the different metrics, the KPIs, revenue is one of them, profit, gross profit, net profit. Those are all standard metrics. Then there's metrics that people don't think about, which is like, what is, how efficient is your business with people? You know, the payroll ratio, the revenue to payroll ratio is really, really important. The cost to goods sold, like what, where should that be depending on your industry? Where should you be? And with cash in the bank, because having profit and having cash in the bank, those are two completely different things. I think cash flow is so critically important. Mm -hmm. And I've seen with some of my clients even where it kind of catches them by surprise, like, oh, all of a sudden it's like there's a cash roll shortage or, oh, we've got to run payroll and there's not really that much in the bank. And they're not sure why that happened. And it's because they're not looking at their cash flow. And so it's like, yeah, on paper, the business is healthy, but there's also the timing. 
of when the money has got to come in and when the money has to go out. So would you say that's something that you often see when you're engaging someone? Yeah, I often have clients that come to us and say, I made a, like my, my profit and loss is showing I made a big profit, but I have no cash. I don't know why. And the answer is because it's not going to be on the P&L. It's going to be usually on the balance sheet. And so it could be a number of things. Maybe you have a lot of loans uh, or credit uh, credit card debt loans, something that you're paying off because uh, the kind of debt. The other is, this is a big one, is taking owner distributions. Yeah. So we call that the difference between the, what, the net income and, and what's actually in the bank. Like that difference is also, we call that burn. You're just burning cash at that point. So a lot of the entrepreneurs that we look, that we talk to are just, they're literally just taking way too much money out for themselves personally. And that is not something that is visible for the profit. It doesn't reduce your profit to take money out as an owner draw. And of course, everybody needs money. You want to make sure that you have enough money to live on, but you might have to budget. Or you might have to make some changes. You might have to budget in your personal life. You might have to budget. I went, actually, I'm going to change it. I'm say you have to budget in your personal life and you have to budget in your business. You have yeah. to understand those things. Yeah, exactly. And know that you've got to pay taxes on the oh, owner yeah. draws as well. So that can catch you by surprise for sure. Yeah. yeah, there's definitely a lot. We find that when we work with people, we're also like, hey, it's the first quarter right now in 2024. Start stocking up cash now. Don't wait yeah. till last quarter. Having three to six months worth of expenses is really important. If you can, and, and not everybody can do that, but if you can start, when I started, I had 10, every time someone paid me, I put 10 bucks in the savings account and it's a, a business savings account. So it yes. doesn't leave the business. So I recommend everybody should have a savings account in their business and I would just move money over. So first it was $10 every time I got paid, then I moved it up to 1%. So it was whatever I could afford, but it's also the habit of yes. giving her. And then after a while, I was like, my goal is to put away 50% of my gross revenue, very high number. Most times I can put away 30%. So 30% gives me enough to pay taxes because it doesn't take into consideration all the expenses. It gives me enough to reinvest back into the business, to save money, to hold on to funds, and to give myself some extra profit if I want to, not or, or not extra profit, extra money. Right. Take it out. But it gives... The more cash you have, it gives you so much more freedom. Do you notice any differences between your male and female clients? I do. I have several female clients that say, oh, I don't know how to do that. You just take care of that for me. I don't want to deal with that. You just take care of that. They have like this fear, I think, yeah. or they were taught to be have someone else take care of it. They even have some female clients that are married and they say, I don't do that. My husband does that for me. And the husband's not even a business owner. Uh, the husband who has his own job or his own business. I hope that, and that's a lot, especially with the older generation, but even the younger generations, I feel that way. Men just automatically, maybe they're taught this way, maybe society shows them this, but men are automatically, they feel financial responsibility from day one. Women don't always feel that way. And I think it's a huge detriment. Yeah, I talk about this in my work. It's like the damsel in distress kind yeah. of energy. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like we're sort of hoping that this white knight will ride in and save the day. And so, of course, what that actually looks like in our business is just trying to abdicate responsibility. And whether it's to your bookkeeper, your accountant, even your fractional CFO, it's like you cannot abdicate responsibility. The financial health of your business is your responsibility if you're the founder, CEO, entrepreneur. But it's just an old pattern. And there's a lot that plays into that. Like we're in a patriarchy. There's a lot of subliminal programming around women's role in finances still, which is why I love bringing women like you on that are in the financial services industry because we need more of that. And I would suspect that for some of your clients, they hire you because you feel more safe and accessible to them. They're willing to ask you questions that they wouldn't otherwise ask. Yeah, I think so. I think the men feel more comfortable also in some ways because there's no competition, maybe. I don't know. Yeah. But a little bit older, too. So I'm kind of like sometimes like their mom a little bit. Right, <laughs> right. I've even had clients ask me for dating advice. I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> uh, Out of scope. 
<laughs> yeah, out of scope. But the relationship between someone, when you talk to someone about money, that relationship is very personal and very private. And it's very therapeutic. I, I always jokingly refer to when we do analysis and we work with clients and we work one on one with clients that it's half money, half therapy. Yeah, is what it turns out to be. And money is very psychological, extremely. Yes, it is. So I was raised to think that I will be married and I won't be working. I won't have a career, but I'll be a mom, a stay at home mom, maybe have like a small job and I'll be taken care of by my husband. And I can't tell you how many times still in my life that, especially when things get hard, even now, I'm like, oh, I just wish I was married and someone else would take care of this for me. Yeah. <laughs> I still feel that way or I still feel small. And I think that women feel small and maybe not intelligent enough or they're scared somehow. It's very triggering. So I want everybody to know, all women to know that it's empowering and it's extremely important for you to understand what's happening. You can get into really big trouble if you don't know, even if you have the most wonderful husband in the world, if something happens to them, you are screwed. So uh, you have to know what's going on financially. You have to understand taxes. If you're a business owner, you have to understand all of these things. You, yes, hire people, let them teach you, let them help you. It's still the responsibility falls back on you to really know what's going on in your business. Yeah. And we get to ask the question as many times as we need to ask it in order to understand. And I think sometimes as women, like we're still not taking up space, even in when we're the client and we're paying for services, it's like we still can feel like a burden to have to ask the same thing over again. Or we pretend like we understand it when we don't, because we just think that like everyone else wants the meeting to be over. And so even just being willing to start to flex that muscle and learn that stuff is so valuable because it's not like some of it's easy and some of it's not. You mm -hmm. might find that it comes easy to you or you might find that it's kind of confusing and that you have to ask it 10 different ways until it starts to sink in. I definitely encourage everyone listening to like, if you don't have people on your financial team to start assembling that team in some way, shape or form. And obviously, depending on the size of your business, it's going to look different. But then also make sure that when you're with those people, like how do they make you feel? Like I can just tell Natalia that like, you make your clients feel good. You make your clients feel empowered. But I know I've had scenarios even where the people on my financial team were like wonderful, loving people, but I was still projecting and working out old stuff. And it's like I would come to the meeting feeling like, is daddy going to be mad at me? Yeah. And so I let myself kind of like work through that and like reparent myself. And then eventually I was like, OK, I'm just really done with this feeling, even though they're not doing anything. I'm just going to seek out a different provider that doesn't trigger me in that same way. And I do. I have had people tell me that sometimes their accountant makes them feel small or makes them feel dumb or doesn't speak more plainly or is actually just rude. I've actually been on calls with clients with their CPAs. So I'm not a CPA and I'm a woman. I do have CPAs that work for me, but uh, I've been on calls with clients and they had like their tax CPA and then being rude and mm -hmm. talked down to us. And I'm like, I don't know why, like you still hire them. Like, why are you paying them? You're paying them. They need, they need to be explaining. And I think that part of that is like an old way of thinking of let's keep the whole accounting and tax situation under wraps. So we seem even more valuable. Mm. And I, I think that's the way it was done in the past. It's, it's all like, yeah, smoke and mirrors, okay. you know, but taxes and taxes are complicated enough. You don't even need to have that attitude because if you're a business owner, you should not be filing your own taxes. You really should. Amen. Yeah. I'm shocked. Like we had some friends who were running a small business and the husband was like using TurboTax for multiple years in a row. I'm like, what are you doing? Because in my opinion, when I look at what accountants charge to file a business tax return, it's really not that much. It's really not that much. Like a lot of them, a lot of times it's like around a thousand bucks and you'll find some for more, some for less. But it's like even if it was two thousand or three thousand, I just feel so confident that my CPA can find something in my return that's going to save me a thousand or two thousand or three thousand dollars that it's a wash. Like there is nothing about it that feels like a difficult investment. And then 
you've got somebody else signing off on it. Like, what if you jack up your own return and then you're on the hook or you get an audit or something like it just blows my mind that there's anyone out there that would even attempt to do it on their own. I don't know why you would want to. It's totally worth the cost. Like you said, it's worth the peace of mind. We get a lot of clients because they're going through an audit. So they find us and we help support them. And they've been like, it's sometimes horribly messy. I had a client that didn't file taxes and didn't have any accounting for five years. Yeah. Business. And I think that part of it was like the fear. So you miss one year and you're like, the fear becomes even more paralyzing. Right. Year over year. So if you're in that situation, just nip it in the bud because it can, you can fix that. It's not as horrible as you think. Just nip it in the bud and get it done. You'll feel so much better. It's like if you have a horrible illness and you don't want to know, you don't go to the doctor, it doesn't change the fact that you have the illness. Right. Uh, having the, the knowledge is really, really important and, and getting that. Yeah, just get your taxes done by someone else. And I recommend, depending on where you're at, I don't recommend that account that entrepreneurs do their own bookkeeping, their own accounting. Right. Because your focus as the business owner should be on growth, sales, marketing, you know, whatever it is, it's to grow the business and to be the business owner. That should be one of the best and the first types of contractors that you contract out, that you get help with. And then, you know, we were talking about like, you know, having a good CPA and someone that listens to you. Make sure that if when you're looking for someone that you ask, that they ask you a lot of questions so that they really understand you. And then be very aware that you usually get what you pay for. So if you're hiring someone that's very inexpensive, the problem is that they don't know how to run their own business if they're too inexpensive. So they can't advise you on yours and they won't be able to give you the time and the energy because they're going to be inundated with too many clients. And so it's just not a good business model. So you're now running a multi seven figure business. You've got employees on your team. What has changed for you? Like what have been some of the surprising things that I don't know, like lessons or things that you feel that you didn't think you would feel you got reached this level of success. So I think that when you're first starting out, it's a matter of just survival and making money. And then once you hit like your first six figures and you're starting to get comfortable, it changes from needing money to bringing value. When you're getting closer to seven figures, it changes from bringing value to your clients to still being bringing value to your clients and bringing a value and building a culture and a team and supporting families and supporting a community. And so for us, it's the business is now an entity all and of its own. It's more important than me personally sometimes. So it's very hard to make some business decisions. Like for instance, if someone is just not being effective and they're not doing their job well, it is really important to get them out and as a person on the personal level, it's hard. It's hard to fire someone or hard to, you know, put them on a performance improvement plan and and criticize what they're doing because we're all people and you wanna you know, you wanna be good to people. That's the hardest thing I feel that all of my clients have also is understanding who should be part of your team and who should stay and who should go. And sometimes they're wonderful people and very effective, but your revenue can't cover it either. Yeah. So understanding that the business is more important than that decision for that one person makes it a little bit easier. So for instance, if I have someone that is not as effective, it's affecting everybody else and affecting our client and their businesses, their families, their employees, affecting every single employee that's uh, in my business. Like if I, I've seen businesses that were too slow to let people go when their revenue tanked. And, and like, then they they risk everybody on the team because the business is the my God, business. So you just, you really have to make decisions according to that. I really believe in like the energy of money. And I know that's probably something that you work on as well and my energy of money. So when I'm feeling overwhelmed or it's not going well, or we're not growing for some reason, or we lose a bunch of clients or something like something happens, I make an effort to donate money. It's mm-hmm. like the opposite of what most people do. So when cash is tight, I send more cash out into the universe. Yeah. Uh, I don't do it to, to the detriment, but I really believe in the energy and that has always worked well for me. It always comes back like threefold. Yes. It's trusting in the circulation and like not gripping so tight to what you have. 
Well, thank you so much for all of that. And I know that there are people listening that are going to want to connect with you and learn more about your services. Where is the best place for them to do that? So I do have a website, zachandconsulting.com. My calendar link and my phone number are actually on there and my email address. Uh, I am also on social media, on Facebook as Zach and Consulting, on Instagram as Grow Your Bottom Line, and then on LinkedIn under Natalia Zacharin. So definitely can like all of those places have either my calendar link or my website or somehow to get in touch with us. Amazing. I love that. So as a final question, what does it feel like for you to be on your joyous path to millions? I feel in some ways, so entrepreneurship is definitely a roller coaster and there are a lot of high highs and a lot of low lows and that's normal, but there's a tremendous amount of freedom and it was a completely different way of thinking than being a W-2 employee. There is no roof and there is no ceiling, right? There's no ceiling to how much you can make. And so if something happens, for instance, my car died the first year and I, I was like, oh no, I can't afford a car payment. And my boyfriend at the time, he's my boyfriend, but he turned to me and he said, that's just one client, just close another client. So it's a matter of thinking very differently. And then the freedom of now I can take care of myself. I can, can take care of my I can take care of my health, uh, which I couldn't do before. I can travel. We're virtual. The whole team is virtual. So I can give back people their flexibility in their lives as well as have one and work from anywhere. So it's been an amazing journey. And looking back and being so grateful, like I can't believe how far we've come and how many people that we've helped and we're able to continue to help. It's been amazing. I love that. Thank you so much for sharing. Thank you for being on the show. I'm going to be in touch with you because I have clients that are looking for your services. And to everyone listening, thank you so much for tuning in and we'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Cool. I loved jamming with Natalia. I actually just sent her two email introductions. So it's always fun when I find someone that we can like do business together as well. Her Instagram tag again is at grow your bottom line. I'm on Instagram at and makes money. So please tag us. Let us know that you listened to this episode. Here are my top takeaways. Number one, sometimes it's good to not have any other options. I love that she was able to alchemize that kind of feeling of back against the wall, I've got to make this work and turned it into a multi-million dollar business. Number two, grit gets you a long way. She said, I didn't feel that smart. I didn't feel necessarily even like that capable, but I knew that I had experiences in my life when I used grit and got what I wanted. Number three, taking sales calls and talk to potential clients in order to understand their pain points. And that can actually help you expand your services and uncover new needs that you otherwise would have missed. Number four, don't budget based off of what's in your bank account today. Work with somebody like Natalia to make sure that you understand cash flow, that you understand projections, that you have money set aside for taxes and things. Like it's something that a lot of multi-six and seven-figure entrepreneurs aren't doing well enough. And it's time to get somebody on your team to help you out with that. Number five, your money wounds are showing up in your bookkeeping. I loved how she talked about she could see whether they were in scarcity or abundance just from their expenses and how they were spending or their lack of spending. And she felt like she was reading their mind just going through their bookkeeping. Those are your money wounds and they're showing up in your business. They're showing up. Of course they are. So let's heal them together. If you haven't joined Money Wound Medicine yet, what are you waiting for? There's wealth that is waiting for you that you are repelling and sabotaging because you have unhealed money wounds. We can heal them together. We can alchemize your wounds into wealth. And it goes so beautifully along with you taking strategic and tactical actions to grow your business. It's a beautiful companion to that. So as always, appreciate you so much for tuning in and I'll see you for next week's episode. Listeners like you have made this a top 3% global podcast. So thank you so much for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, share, and leave a review. I also love hearing listener feedback, so feel free to slide into my DMs on Instagram at mmakesmoney. If you would like to explore hiring me as your money healer and business mentor, hit the link in the show notes or head to explore.emilywilcox.com. 
Until next time, I'm sending you all the magic money vibes on your joyous path to millions.